This is John Black, Super Chemist. Our last video, we were taking chromium hydroxide all the way up to the sodium dichromate. This was our last equation. Um, we had a quarter mole of the sodium chromate, and we added the acid to get our dichromate. And if you notice, a dichromate, di means two. That just means there's two chromates. Um, so if you need two to get one, it's a one to a half of a ratio, or two to one ratio. This is going to be twice as much as that. But dichromate is kind of like, like two chromates shoved together. Look at this one here. Uh, you got, you start out with one chromate, because there's two there, right? And let's say that meets up with these two protons, right? You're going to have two positives, because there's one positive, but there's two protons. So that's a plus two. And this is already a negative two. So for this water to be neutral, that means that the negativity had to come from the oxygen, leaving this neutral and this neutral, right? Because you got a plus two and a negative two. They combine, it's neutral. Now... You got two of them there. Let's say you get your second one, right? And it reacts with this. See, these are the same. Now you got a neutral and a negative two. So you're going to end up with a negative two, right? And as you can see, there's two chromiums, two chromiums. And this one had its oxygen given away to the water, right? So it's only got three. But this one has four plus three is seven. See how it all works out? Now this bottom half here, I'm just trying, I don't, I just made that up. I'm just trying to explain how it's, this dichromate is actually two chromates. Whether it goes through this merger merle or not, I don't know. But it looks nice and simple for you to see how this is two of these. It's just that some acid came along and swiped out one of the negative two oxygens and made some water. That's the only difference. And if you look at this formula, and you can see I have equilibrium arrows uh, because it goes back and forth. Um, it depends on the pH, like I said. Now, if you want this to go back, if you want it shifted to the left, you would add hydroxide. If you have, chrom if you have chromate and you want dichromate, you add acid. If you want to change it back, to the chromate, right, you would add hydroxide. This would shift the equilibrium to this. And then if you want to shift it back, add some more acid. But each time you do that, the acid's also reacting with the base, and you're just building up a bunch of salt in there. So if we had a quarter mole of sodium chromate, which we did at most, uh, then at most we can only have an eighth of a mole of the sodium dichromate. So as, as you can see in our new equation, uh, you got your sodium dichromate. Uh, you're going to add in some potassium chloride, and that will make your dichromate and some sodium chloride. How did I figure out how much uh, potassium chloride to use? Well, there's 74.6 grams in a mole. This is an eighth of a mole. This gets twice as much, right? So I got an eighth of a mole because this is one mole divided by eight gives me that which is an eighth of a mole. As you can see down here, it's twice as much. So two times that is 18.64 grams. But I boiled down the potassium chloride in the water to where it was hot, boiling, and concentrated. So anyways, before we add this, we want to make sure that this, this right here is concentrated. You want to boil all the water out so it's almost precipitated. And uh, then when it's concentrated, um, add in this potassium chloride. That way, when you add this potassium chloride in, you will have a precip almost immediately, at least a little bit. And then within a minute or five minutes, it'll, you'll have a lot of precip. And that's because when you add this into water, the sodium chromate is soluble. It will split up into ions, sodium and chromate. When you add potassium chloride to water, it's soluble. The potassium and the chloride will split up into ions and go into water. But when you mix these two together, now you have four different types of ions in the water. But 
when this potassium ion contacts this dichromate ion, it's a it's not very soluble, and so it will precip out. I, when I did that in the video, I had some precip, uh, and uh, if I wouldn't have put that in the freeze in the refrigerator, what precipped out is pretty much pure as pure can be. If you put the potassium chloride into the sodium chromate solution, um, and there is no temperature difference after that, meaning you do it at room temperature and you don't cool it, you don't heat it, you don't, whatever precips out is pretty much pure potassium dichromate. There's nothing else can pre precip out or it would have before you put in your solution of potassium chloride. But anytime you like boil it, and then put the potassium chloride in and then cool it down. Now other stuff like the sodium chloride, a couple grams of that can precip out too. Now when I added my potassium chloride, the sodium dichromate was saturated, but it was at room temperature. Um, there was nothing, no particles in it, you know, no precip, uh, but it was at room temperature. And I put the potassium chloride in and it, Almost immediately, I got precip. I put it in the refrigerator, and I got 20 grams out. Now, if you want to get more on that first batch, um, what you really should do is I should have, when I was concentrating that sodium dichromate down, it was already nice and hot. When it was boiling hot, I should have added my potassium chloride right then and there while it was, you know, scalding hot, almost boiling. That way, when I cooled it down, I would really get a lot of precip uh, between, you know, boiling and freezing compared to room temperature and cooling it down to freezing. I did two more crystallizations um, where I boiled it down and then let it cool and, uh, you know, precip some stuff out and filter it. Um, a lot of people might just do that one time. I did it two times. Of course, if I would have added the potassium chloride to the sodium chromate while it was uh, almost boiling hot and concentrated, I probably would have only re I probably would have only crystallized it one more time after that instead of three times. I would have just done it twice. As you remember, I had about 50 grams of salt, uh, and I mixed them all together, um, and then I recrystallized that down. This is after one recrystallization. Re I uh, got about 33 grams. This still is not pure. So you figure you recrystallize this again. I don't I don't really like recrystallizing it where you boil it and uh, cool it down like that. I like to do it naturally. I like to let it evaporate naturally, not with heat. The only reason I boiled them down for the crystallization and the first recrystallization was because I put them in a distillation apparatus um, so that... Uh, all the fumes were contained with the bubbler because there's acid and stuff in it. But by the time you get to this point where you're at your second recrystallization, you can do it the slow processed way of evaporation uh, because it won't stink now. <laughs> well, the theoretical yield is 36.75 grams. Uh, the first recrystallization, I actually had a total of 33 grams. Um, now, the second recrystallization, I didn't do. Remember, it went up mix that up with some other stuff and do it all, all at once. But let's say I did recrystallize it. I'd probably lose about five grams. Uh, so that leaves us with 28 grams. Um, if I divide that, I'll get 0.75 or 75% of yield. So that's not that bad, uh, considering that you have an equilibrium between that and the chromic acid. Now I want you to keep in mind, if you had potassium hydroxide, you would stop right here. You would already have potassium dichromate. So you could stop right there and just um, crystallize that out because it's so um, insoluble in cold water. And then you wouldn't have to go to this next step to do the potassium chloride thing because you already have your potassium attached. All right, I want you to look at this solubility chart. In our scenario, we used sodium hydroxide and we used hydrochloric acid. So our byproduct is sodium chloride.
These solubilities are only when the salt is in solution by itself, but they tell you something. I want you to look at the percentages of what precips between boiling and freezing. Put the potassium dichromate, 95% precips out. Now look at the sodium chloride, only 9% can precip out. Now I'm just guessing on the amounts of salts here on the grams, but it's pretty close to what our experiment was. Um, I just want to show you this example. Let's say the first time you recrystallize this, you're going to get 95, not 5%, 9% of this and 95% of that. So you end up with this. Second recrystallation, you do it again. Look, look at how the table salt goes from 5 grams down to half a gram down to 0 0.045 grams. That's like nothing. But after two crystal recrystallizations, you're already down to a half a gram. That's nothing compared to 31 grams. <laughs> Now look at the bottom one, a 95%. You start out with 35 grams. You only get rid of two, get rid of two, get rid of one. You're not getting rid of hardly any of the uh, potassium dichromate. Even though there's a lot more salt in grams than uh, the dichromate, it doesn't matter because this is barely soluble at all. And this does not want to precip out. If you use potassium hydroxide and acetic acid as your acid, your byproduct will be potassium acetate. Look at the solubility. It's greater than 100 grams in boiling. But the great thing is, is look at freezing. 216 grams. So pretty much nothing of that will precip out. And all of this will, or almost all of it. You can see very little is soluble in freezing water. Keep in mind, if you use a different acid, then your byproduct, you put your acid on this side, and you put your hydroxide on this side. And that way you'd know what your byproduct is. This is a predominance diagram. Though. I forgot to put the letter E at the end of predominance. Yeah, that small letter P, C, R, that is the vertical axis. Um, that represents the concentration of chromium in the in the solution. Now the horizontal axis, uh, pH, you know what that is, uh, that represents the pH. Just so you can see, this is the ratios, you know, in graph form of what you might get for each pH. Um, chromate and dichromate are, pr are pretty much in equilibrium. And depending on what the pH, and even the chromic acid, but uh, depending on what the pH is, that's why you always want to get this above 7 and be basic if you're going for chromate. If you're going for dichromate, I go a, a 2. And if you're going for chromic acid, I try to make it even more acidic. I haven't figured all that out yet because we're only up to dichromate and chromate. So, uh, this is your pH. As you can see, if you get a pH of 6 pretty much, or above 6, you pretty much just have chromate and dichromate and no chromic acid. And as you move up, you get less dichromate and more chromate. And right here, about 6.7 or 8 or whatever, um, you pretty much have mostly all chromate. Um, that's why I'm not sure what pH you're supposed to take it down to. I took mine down to a 1 or a 2. I tried to get it at a 2. So if anyone knows what the best pH sh should be, give me a post and let me know. So who knows? It really only goes down to a 5 pH, so I, I don't know. Uh, but I took it to a 1 or 2. <clears throat> let me know if you know better. But this shows that uh, the lower the pH, I mean, yeah, the lower the pH, the less chromate you're going to have. But the screwed up thing is, is you also have chromic acid no matter what you do. Once you get so low, you're going to have impurities of chromic acid in there. So, I mean, maybe that's also why I didn't get such a good yield. Anyways, I want you to always remember, science is great.